Thank you. Everything she said is true. Um, I did write a book, and that's what it looks like sideways. Here's what it looks like right side up with a fake mustache on it that my daughter put on. Um, so just quick reference point, show of hands, how many of you have read Bowling Across America? My in-laws are here, and anyone else who raised their hands is lying or just being nice. I, I'm not here to change that, and I don't think I will. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, why I wrote it and, and the process of getting it written and published. And there's a, um, it was never destined and is still not destined to be a major motion picture. You don't hear me talking about this on NPR or see it gracing the pages of, of GQ um, like some of our other speakers. But uh, it's very special to, to finish a book and hold it in your hands. And um, it's from the father of two children. It's easily in the top two moments of your life uh, along there with holding your children, holding your book. I won't tell you which of the children I was less pleased to hold. <laughs> top three, easily top three. Uh, and, then, and then you finally get, you know, you've got the book in your hands and you go and you, you know there's a review waiting for you and you go to Publishers Weekly and you see that it's a clever enough story. And that's hard, you try to spin it in your head. Maybe, maybe it goes on to say something better. It lacks dramatic tension. So this was the first review I, I read, and then I, you know, bucked myself up. Not everyone's gonna love it, it's not for everyone. In fact, uh, the Onions AV Club gave it a B plus, which is almost an A minus. So I was feeling a lot better about myself, and then my hometown magazine, the one that I actually read, uh, finally reviewed and weighed in on it. Bowling Across America isn't really about bowling, but it's not about anything that poignant either. <laughs> and I've read Chicago Magazine, there's nothing poignant in it, but I'm not here to get defensive about it. So, uh, truth be told, I was, I was prepared for this kind of thing to happen because I had already sold the book. I had published it, and I was uh, fine with that, I knew it would happen, uh, but the publishing process itself is full of rejection and abuse not unlike bowling alleys. Um, and, and so I had an agent who helped me shop it around and he would very helpfully send me by email the rejections that he was getting on my behalf. So this was his way of, I guess, demonstrating that he was working on it. Uh, and I would get things in my inbox that said, neither the subject nor the writing really knocked me out. It's from, from different editors that we might have seen. And that's, you know, not everyone's gonna love it. Uh, another one, this book is an exercise in artificiality. Um, I guess that's being nitpicky, isn't it? <laughs> like people who use the word artificiality are an exercise in artificiality. Um, this one came in, I was laughed out of the room by my colleagues for suggesting we publish this. <laughs> it, and the, the tail end of that was at a really low price. They were gonna give me like $10 and he still couldn't get it sold. So there was all of that, these, these terrible things coming in through email, but my agent would just, he would work so hard to spin it the right way and he would say, oh no, it's actually, that, that no was actually a good thing. It wasn't right, but they, they said positive things. And this is one of the things, one of the most positive rejections I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Take it from me. So anyway, uh, that was the, uh, the self-deprecating part of getting it written and getting it published, and that was kind of fun. But uh, why do this? What about this book? And what about um, a, a successful travel memoir or any memoir or even a mediocre memoir uh, are the key components? And I want to talk about those as part of the storytelling theme. And the first is, obviously, you need a traumatic life event. Every good memoir starts with that. And this is uh, a picture of me with my father when I was probably seven or eight. He was... Uh, I'm not good at math, and I didn't do, look that up ahead of time. But he passed away when I was 25 years old. Um, so that was the traumatic life event that spawned Bowling Across America, which he's probably not looking down too fondly at that. Like, that was my legacy. Um, but he was, a, uh, he was a kind man, great father, had six kids. Here we are. I only have photos from uh, the early 1980s. Uh, here we are standing in front of the family truckster um, sending one of my uh, siblings off to college. I'm the one in the vest, looking handsome. Um, but my father had a small business, uh, employed several people, and it still does. It was taken over by uh, my brother Ronald McDonald there with the afro and pajamas at, at noon on a Saturday. 
uh, somehow successfully running the family business now. But my father had, a, had another goal in life, and that was to play a game called handball in all 50 states and in, uh, on every continent. And he actually passed away while playing handball in Ohio, in his home state. Uh, and it was that that prompted me to want to wanna avenge his death is probably the wrong word, but pay homage to him. Uh, so uh, it would have been reckless for him to have quit his job and gone and played handball in all 50 states. So we did it when we were on family vacations or otherwise. And um, that leads us to the hero's journey that Sonia uh, alluded to. I was 27 years old. A couple years after my father died, I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to quit my job and not play handball in all 50 states because handball is really hard on your hands. It hurts uh, a lot. You can't even hold a pen after you've played handball for a couple of hours. Uh, and if I was going to write a book, that would have been a terrible thing. So I quit my job and said, I'm going to go bowling in all 50 states. Why? Uh, because bowling alleys are awesome. They're a part of America. There are um, bowling alleys everywhere you go, you, except for America's Georgia, which is a story I'm not going to tell tonight. But if you went there on a whim deciding you were going to bowl there, you'd be sorely mistaken. Um, so, so bowling alleys have this great Americana, this kitsch about them, this kind of wacky place to hang out, but they also have people in there, and there, were, there was these people's stories that I wanted to tell, and um, a couple of folks I'll talk about here. This is a guy named Walter Menders, and I met Walter in Rhode Island where he was bowling on a Tuesday afternoon with the Seniors League. All sorts of people are in bowling alleys. You've got senior citizens bowling alongside a kid's birthday party, and then the factory workers come at night for a league, and then um, you know, teenagers come there to sneak beer when they're underage and make out for the first time in a semi-public place. And these things are all happening in bowling alleys. Bowling alleys. And so I thought, what a perfect lens through which to see America. And, and so uh, Walter, whose nickname was Spaghetti, for reasons I never was able to discern from him, uh, was showing me pictures of his family and talking about his wife, who we met in Africa just after World War II um, and convinced her to, to come home with a, a young GI in the Navy. And this was another guy I met to prove the point that there are all kinds of people in bowling alleys. In another bowling alley, this one in Arizona, this gentleman's name I never got, uh, except that it was the Skull Crusher. And it says so on his hat. Uh, it says so on his shirt. And he gave me a business card. It said so on that, too. Skull Crusher um, was the DJ at, at the bowling alley there. And despite the name, couldn't have been a nicer man. And will crush your skull with a triple rock block of journey, should you ever go to the um, Fairmont Lanes in Scottsdale, Arizona. So the people in the bowling alleys uh, were, were part of the hero's journey. It was less about me, more about them. But there's another uh, piece of any successful or mediocre memoir, and that is dramatic tension. And so I'm in Pittsburgh, and I'm talking to a woman about what I do. I'm, I'm interviewing her to be in a book about bowling, and the guy with this arm shows up, and he had two of these. He had one on the other side that was just as big and tattooed, and uh, I'm talking to his girlfriend, it turns out, and he wasn't pleased with that, and he was about to kick my ass, sorry, uh, to beat me up. And, uh, and then I told him I was writing a book about this, and I wanted to interview him as well, and as we know from Publishers Weekly, there was no dramatic tension. <laughs> I was able to defuse the situation. So that one didn't really go anywhere. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, a life lesson. And, and uh, truth be told, I, I, don't, I didn't internalize all of the reviews, but I think the Publishers Weekly one also said, if you're looking for a life lesson, maybe want to look elsewhere. Uh, and to that I say, uh, the, the title doesn't really promise a life lesson. It promises bowling across America and, spoiler alert, 50 states in rented shoes is given away at the title. The ending is already there for you. But uh, there are life lessons throughout it, and the one I will tell about this one is from a small town in Iowa called Jefferson, Iowa, and there's not much in it but a town square, a little tavern, restaurant, and a bowling alley that's the other restaurant in town. And I was there one night at uh, 9 o'clock or so, and I couldn't bowl because there were leagues happening on the other side of the restaurant wall. And I'm talking with the owner, Vicki, she and her husband John own the place, and she said, Mike, you're writing this book, you've got to come over here and see what's happening. And so she beckons me behind the bar, and I'm looking through a sort of the half doorway onto the lanes, and she said, the guy in the red hat just bowled his 11th strike. If he bowls a 12th one, you all know that's a 300. That's a perfect game. That's, it's not quite as hard as pitching a no-hitter, but that's, for a bowler, that's the thing. It's like getting a hole in one. And so I'm watching and watching, and he gets up, and the whole bowling alley goes silent. It's packed. Everyone in town is there. And he gets up to the line, 
and he rolls the ball, just like he did every other time. He actually did it with his hand, I think, because he's named, uh, and, and he gets the strike. He rolls a 300. Again, no dramatic tension. We knew that was going to happen, right? But he nailed it, and we all, the whole place exploded, ran up, tossed him, knocked his cap off, tossed his hair. I'm giving him a hug, and I, I realize this is such an awkward thing. I don't even know his name. So, <laughs> I say, you know, congratulations. He said, I've been trying to do that all my life. Uh, I said, what's your name? He said, Larry Gray. But my friends all call me Lefty. And that night in that bowling alley in that town in America, everyone was a friend of Lefty's. Thanks so much.